And now, it's time for The Spirit Campfire, starring Ted Nugent and John Brinkus. It's the show about the physics of spirituality with attitude. Monday, drag races all day at the Moore City <laughs> Madhouse. Get your horse right here, boys and girls. Spirit campfire, the spirit, the physics of spirituality with attitude. John, you're my man. Man, I'll tell you what, the science I'm known for being the sports science guy. And now we're talking about the science of spirituality with attitude. I asked you, I said, what's the tagline for the spirit campfire? You responded within five seconds. The science of spirituality with attitude. Here's my question. What does that mean to you? Well, it means uh, being the best you can be and putting your heart and soul into your any given endeavor, whether it's a uh, parenting or husbanding or conservation or welding one of my favorite i think the greatest heroes in the world are welders by the way you know everything i know is a mechanic and a plumber and a rancher and a farmer and they run the feed mill and they manage a hardware store and they're master mechanics and i've noticed and i've, I've watched just recently remember you're this is a good yin and yang john you're the yin i'm the yang or maybe i'm the yang you're the yin but it doesn't really matter because it's the physical spirituality with attitude. So I don't pay attention to athletic sports, even though my archery, my bow hunting, my off-road racing, and the way I play guitar on stage is indeed sports. It's athletic. Right. But I just recently saw, because I don't watch these programs. I, I never do. I did watch the Pistons and the Red Wings when they were winning all those games because my sons loved that. But I noticed even before I understood that there was, there's already a colloquialism, the physics of spirituality. I didn't have that at my beck and call, but as I watched those Red Wings on the ice and I watched Bruce Lee, or I just saw the last dance featuring the Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan and the dedication of those su supreme athletes. If anybody's questioning what the physics of spirituality is, those guys are sad. When I play my guitar or when I cradle my grandchild or when I host the family of a hero that gave his life for our country. There's the physical, you hug, and there's the tears, and there is a campfire. That's why I wanted to use the word campfire, because there, there's always a campfire when we celebrate emotions in the Nugent family. And I find that it is undeniable, and you elaborate this as a sports guy. Yeah. You've witnessed, that isn't just great dribbling. That isn't just great quarterbacking and running. Those guys are stream of spirituality conscious. They are above and beyond the call of duty, not just of average people, but once you pursue that excellence, those guys ascend beyond yesterday, don't they? Yesterday they oh. were off, and you see when they finally win or making three-point after three-point, they're out of body. That's their spiritual inner power. Am I right or am I right? Uh, do you, no. You're 100% right. And what's interesting is I think that a lot of people uh, like to talk about being in the zone. And a lot when you're in the zone and you're doing something, like when you're playing guitar, are you thinking about the next note you're playing? It no, comes no. from somewhere. Remember the, uh, Tom Cruise in The Last Samurai and he couldn't get the sword thing down? And the, the, right. his, his samurai instructor went, too many minds. Well, let me tell you, I shot my bow and arrow today. I shoot it every day. It's, right. it's ultimate escape, John. I, I emphasized this the last time we were together, and I'm going to continually emphasize it, because if you get a bow and arrow, I suppose you can casually fling arrows, but eventually you're going to want to get closer. Aim small, miss small. You're going to want to put those arrows at the X, not close to the X, in the X. And, and what you find yourself doing is finding all your gifts from God in my six foot two, 230 pounds, but it takes more upstairs. Every Olympic archer that has coached me, I've been so blessed to have that moment, and the snipers with the Navy SEALs and the Marine, are you kidding me? You don't just pull the trigger and take a deep breath and sight acquisition. You are one with the tool. You are one with the guitar. When I'm playing the guitar, John, my biggest challenge in life is to not lose control because you do want to go completely nuts. You want to find notes 
and musical sequences that aren't legal. You want to right. <laughs> just berserk, They're but you might fall and hurt yourself. So you've got to have the physics and right. the spirituality so you get it across with your fellow bandmates. So I think that, you know, when we talk about the science of spirituality with attitude, what I love about that phrase is let's call it like this being in the zone and being present, being here right now. It doesn't require thought. It doesn't require planning. It, it, it simply is. And when a lot of people ask me about what does it mean to be in the zone? When I, I've had the great fortune of speaking with and working with the greatest athletes on the planet. And what they all say about being in the zone is the ball is bigger. The, the, everything is easier, that everything is moving slower. And the reason why, when you are present, you are ingesting everything and able to say, this is important. This is not important. The crowd noise I can filter out. I know that I'm paying attention to this. You're able to be in that moment and things are moving slower because you can focus on the things as they are. And it is very similar to, you know, that the, the Matrix, I think, is just such an amazingly creative movie where, you know, there's this reality and then, then this alternative reality. And when you're in the zone and when you're in touch with God and in touch with your own spirit, the fusion of those things creates a moment where you're not thinking. You're simply being and doing with effort. It's just totally effortless. And you keep hearing that regardless of race, regardless of religion, regardless of gender, everybody experiences this thing of being in the zone. And music for me, I play guitar as well. I write music, obviously. You know, Ted Nugent is an icon. When I play music and I pick up my guitar, I don't know where the notes come from. I don't know what's coming next. And you get in the zone. It's amazing how you'll sit down at a keyboard Five hours later, you're like, what happened? You were you were just present. It went by in a snap because you were in touch with God. Absolutely. And what you're talking about, you've touched on a lot of points there, but I I, I am anything but all-knowing. In fact, I'd like to think of myself as just a mushy brain sponge picking up information and experiences from the world around me. That's why as a hunter, I naturally, before I understood my relationship with the Native American peoples, eventually yep. they would reach out to me and reference a, state, a statement I made or a song, The Great White Buffalo, or Geronimo and Me, or Spirit of the Buffalo, or Living in the Woods, or Tooth, Fang, and Claw. I, I think I mentioned this before, John, but in reference to what drives my pulsations, it's obviously God, family, country, and my family is everything as I service God and making my country stronger by being a good husband and a father and member of the community. It all is one big giant roaring snowball down the mountain of blizzardy. <laughs> right. What I learned is when I hang out with a Fred Bear of the bow hunting world or Mickey Thompson and Parnelli Jones teach me how to read the terrain in an off road desert race or the Native Americans inviting me into their sweat lodge, talking about the physics of spirituality with attitude, John, and that they would fight the goofy guitar player from Detroit because they saw that I, I celebrate and promote the mystical flight of the arrow being one. And I, didn't, I couldn't have told you the samurai connection very many years ago, but I realized that the, the beasts who attain the highest level. That's why I thought that last dance uh, sequence that I watched recently about the Bulls and, and Michael Jordan and his incredible teammates and the and, yeah. and, and the, the team effort. Those guys, and isn't that what Phil, he really emphasized that spiritual side. He brought he in did. the Native American Grigri. I don't know if you know what Grigri is, but uh, uh, Dr. John would talk about down in Louisiana, down in, down in uh, down along the bayou that the natives would bring gree gree to bring your spirit so my right. show called spirit of the wild this is the spirit campfire as rowdy and as physical and down to earth dirty hands-on planting trees as i am i would say that 
the spiritual side of my life is what makes the physical part of my life most fulfilling and brings the most life. So that's available to everybody watching this. We, we hope to promote that all the time here. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things is obviously, you know, when you look at the world today and you look at kind of, you know, the rhetoric that's going on, I think it's important that we figure out ways to rise above the rhetoric, to soar, to soar above it and to not, not get trapped and caught in negativity, but really to look inside at our positive spirit and to somehow bring that out. One thing that's interesting, Ted, is when you and I met, and like literally we like clicked like this. And one of the things that you and I have in common is we don't do drugs. I've never done drugs. We don't drink. Yeah. It's no like, poison. No poison. Like no poison. <laughs> it's like, it's crazy to find two adults. You know, we have 120 years between us and we're like, we don't do drugs. And I'd love, I'd love to get your thought as to why not? Because if you, if, if I were to, if I were to tell people, look, Ted Nugent, doesn't do drugs. He, he never has done drugs. And I say, this is this picture right here is a man <laughs> that's going to create a movement and he's going to stand for, he's going to stand for goodness and being wholesome. This picture that is iconic is not one that people would say, I bet he doesn't do drugs. They're going to say, what is that guy on? That picture as almost every picture of me caught live in concert, because I am out of body. I am seeking the samurai spirit of the collaborative musical communication with my fellow bandmates who have always been the greatest virtuosos in the world. So what you see in young Ted there, first of all, I was really horny throughout my teenage years. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> From like eight to 72, there was, a, there was a real physical portion to the spirituality. And so I've always been very intense. John, have you noticed this that I'm a little more exuberant than your average bear. And that's because I've been clean and sober. And it's why I stayed clean and sober. Because I don't want to miss nothing. I don't want yeah. comfortably numb. I want comfortably comfortable, but tuned in. And if you're going to be blessed beyond words to share a musical journey with the caliber of musicians I've been surrounded with all my life. Right. I, I think it would be rude to be stoned or drunk and miss out on a chance to share ideas, to cultivate ideas, to debate ideas, to unite ideas. And all those things I just said, can you do those better tuned in or can right. you do those better drunk? For you and me, you know, it, what's interesting is being, you know, being intoxicated is in some ways blasphemous to your right intellectual now, discussion. I'm intoxicated right now on the physics of right. spiritual mind. Don't ever underestimate that, John. <laughs> I, I get high That's on right. my dogs. I get high on the – right now, people wonder why I'm, if I'm like this all the time. Yes, all the time. There are ducks. There are black-winged tree ducks, wood ducks, just literally splashing right out beyond this laptop. And right. – I don't know if it was a, a cara cara, a Mexican eagle that went over or a couple of vultures because they had their wings out. It was just awesome. But, but my life in the great outdoors, the supreme definitive healing powers of nature, you, you're not going to be able to grasp or participate or appreciate unless you're cocked, locked, and ready to rock, Doc. And that's what I've always aspired to. So when you show pictures where... It looks like I just took a small <laughs> truck up the butt. It's because <laughs> the song was called Cat Scratch Fever, because what else are you going to sing? The nah, 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 nah. And of course, <laughs> that was the original title out. of the song. Nah, 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 nah. And so, and so if you're going to, if you're going to really swan dive into the whitewater rapids of musical exploration, you're probably going to get big eyed like that. And you might have a crazy idea, just like when you asked me about a logo. I said, if you have a campfire, there should be an element of red, white, and blue. And it should yep. exude freedom and individualism and, 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 and America. And even though we're going to have a lot of people from around the world, I've, I've been talking to people from Ireland and Switzerland and, and Japan today and Australia and New Zealand. That spirit 
of our constitution and freedom that is unique to an experiment in self-government here in the United States. Yeah. It is contagious and dreamy for everyone. So those images are not just artistic. They really are my life. That's a, that, all they, my life. I was born in a hunting family, and I've never missed a hunting season. This will be my 72nd opening day come October. Right. Well, one, one thing that I love is the idea that you did correct me, and I stand corrected. You are intoxicated. So... <laughs> <laughs> I apologize for even implying that you weren't. See, my, my intoxication is so beautiful because it doesn't include drool, spittle, or death. And uh, you generally are able, you, you generally don't defecate in yourself. In generally. Typically, that's a, something you avoid when you're in tune with yourself. But let me also, <laughs> a lot of people think I'm condemning drinking or even I have friends that smoke dope. I'm not condemning them. I would yeah. rather continue to gently try to persuade them that clean and sober is more alive. It's more alive. People right. get drunk and stoned think they're freer because maybe they abandon responsibility and accountability and get crazy. But that also includes drunk driving. And that's just a horrible, horrible curse in this world. So let me clarify my brothers, my sister, my sons, my daughters, my wife. I, I even drink a little red wine around the campfire once in a while. But they'll have a beer instead of a, a sugar drink. And I think a beer is way better for you than a sugar drink. Right. Uh, so I'm not condemning uh, imbibing. I'm condemning losing touch so that you become a liability instead of an asset. I want to be an asset to you on this show, John. And I, yep. I insist on being an asset to my family, my friends, and my country. And the good earth. So I think the, it, it's a good time right now. We, uh, we did a show called Salute Across America, and that's where, Ted, you and I met. And Killcliff was one of the brands that um, sponsored it. Killcliff is the clean energy drink company. You know, when you're thinking about what you're putting into your body, they are sponsoring this show. Uh, tonight we're streaming on Killcliff, uh, on Killcliff's YouTube platform. But for this show, you can go to killcliff.com, enter in the code CAMPFIRE, get 10% off the clean energy drink. They have an amazing CBD beverage that uh, has worked wonders for me in terms of inflammation for me personally. So anyway, go to killcliff.com, enter in CAMPFIRE, uh, and get 10% off. One thing that I wanted to address, um, Ted, was a moment in life in terms of a campfire. What I... When people say, why campfire? For me, personally, a campfire is light. That is light. It is bright. And all around it, you can see where it falls off. You can see where the light falls off so that you can focus. You can be in a moment. For me, a campfire moment, a moment of, of the physics of spirituality, was when I, the way that I met my wife. I met my wife when I was traveling. I was with somebody else. We had a ticket mix-up. I was in Denver and I sat next to the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. Felt instantly in love. We had a mechanical problem on the plane. Everybody had to get off. I went up to the guy who I was traveling with and I said, I'll give you a hundred bucks to stay away from me because I just met the girl I'm going to marry. And you know, you would have done the same thing, right? Because this guy is moving in and he can't stop talking. So I'm like, stay away from me. She calls her parents and says, hey, I just met the guy I'm going to marry. We decide to exchange information. Turns out we live two blocks away from each other on the same street in Los Angeles. Now, run the odds on that. The odds are not slim to not. The odds are in, so infinitesimally small that that is the way that spirituality works. I was present. I knew this is where I'm supposed to be. This is who I'm supposed to be with. And as it turns out, we lived right next to each other. What's a moment for you, Ted, that's like that, that, sub, that like defies explanation? It can't be a coincidence. It's just God in the universe working in, the, in its mysterious way. When you uh, intentionally and aggressively pursue not just the road less traveled, but the no road untraveled, I mean, both literally and figuratively, um, uh, you're going to encounter a lot of fascinating moments. Um, and I could keep you here for a hundred days and we could burn down an old redwood forest, keeping the campfire going, but I'll keep, I'll hit you with this one. I was invited to speak, uh, to the Assiniboine and the Grovan Native American tribes up in Montana. And right. they have, they have brought back the buffalo with the Native American Conservation Society. And the buffalo is at its all time high since the 
government slaughtered them uh, manifest destiny. And it's a great celebration because the buffalo is such a beast. And I have great, not just respect for these animals that are, are, are the beasts of the earth that give us food, clothing, shelter, tools, medicine, weapons, spirit, uh, fuel. I mean, the buffalo literally was the mobile life support for quality of life for the native peoples. And I know this, I've always sang about it and, and written about it and, and celebrated it. And they knew that, so they invited me because they had to kill some buffalo. Because again, X habitat can only support so much life and they have to have a harvest every fall and winter to make room for the next year's calves because there's a mountain they can't live on and there's a cattle ranch they can't go to and there's a highway they can't. So it's always finite. Well, long story short, I'm out there with my buffalo, with my bow and arrow, with the native uh, tribal leader. And we have a great relationship. We're talking about the things that unite us um, regardless of any differences. We only focused on those things that unite us. And most, most powerfully, our love of nature and our, our instinct as stewards of these precious resources for air, soil, water quality, which is quality of life. And that comes from wildlife habitat. A healthy buffalo right. will not decimate the ground. It will just renew the ground. So right. I actually killed this buffalo. And it's a, it's a moment in time, John. And the hunters that are listening right now, they know that it, it's out of body because you're not just killing an animal. You're accepting a gift. If you hone your predatorship and you practice with your bow and arrow or your rifle and you use the wind and the terrain and you use stealth as a reasoning predator, you have to earn the gift. Right. Serious stuff. It's fun. It's exciting. It's challenging. And it's intense. And it's frustrating often, but it's, it's the essence of life. Well, as we approach this buffalo, I'm telling you, the snow was horizontal. I mean, whoosh, the wind was blowing in the heavy wool cold clothing we had on. And when I shot this buffalo, his big front end cape was swaying in the wind. When he looked at me and he's galloped off, the snow's flying and it's whooping in the wind. It was a treacherous snow blow. Well, after you take the beast and you see him fall, you want the physics of spirituality. You know that you've taken a life and you've accepted a gift and it's going to feed the people. You're going to use it all. It's reverence, not just respect, reverence. John, I'll try to yep. make my composure here. As we walked up to this buffalo, the wind snorting, John. Yep. And this elder took out a braid of sweet grass and had to hold it under his coat from the wind and light it. Because you walk around the fallen beast almost as the last rites. Hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to struggle getting through this. Right. We walked around that buffalo. He's huge. He's a monster. And by the time we got halfway around that buffalo, John, it's like someone threw a switch. Hmm. The wind stopped. The snow, you can see it in my eyes. Wow. And overhead, I looked up. And there was an eagle circling us. No. So you're talking about finding the woman that you're going to become soulmates with. That's divine intervention. I've had a lot of that in my life. But this moment was a, a, a reaffirmation of the calling to intelligently manage wildlife for valuable utility. Right. And that you're doing God's work. So we call this the physics of spirituality with attitude. If anything in life identifies the physics, it would be a buffalo in a blizzard. And if anything defines spirituality, it would be that divine intervention took place. The storm stopped. And there was an eagle. This eagle was not there. Eagles don't fly in blizzards. Right. His presence caused the blizzard to halt. I don't know, but I'll tell you, I cried like a baby. I looked up in the sky and I had tears rolling down my cheeks. They were freezing on my mustache. And that, that chief put his arm on his hand on my shoulder and he goes, the great spirit is with us. The great spirit. Yeah. Is with us. So if you wonder why 
I'm like I am, those kinds of experiences, John, that's, that's, a, that's a calling from God and a reminder in a world where you create animal rights and you have anti-hunting and you want to defund police departments and you got crazy stuff. Common sense comes from the ground up. And I think that was God's way of saying, Ted, it's like my dad and Fred Bear said, don't defend hunting, promote it and celebrate it because it's the perfect valuing of this resource that now has room for next year's production. So you can imagine how I felt after that. That's uh, that's an amazing story. You know, it's it's interesting how, you know, those stories of being out in nature and that obviously is just just an just amazing story, right? Like you have this um, just beautiful beast of an animal that's going to provide for so many. And you do, you you feel as though the presence is there. And everybody has that story in nature. You know, I lost my father recently. And, you know, when you when anybody tries to question the physics of spirituality. You ever stood in a room with someone who was dying and the moment before they die and that moment immediately after they pass, you know they've passed. Something has changed. Something is different. And, you know, my mom has been in medicine her entire life. And, you know, regardless of anybody's pol political beliefs or religious beliefs, I, I can tell you the one thing that is constant there is a spirit in everything. Like it's, that's very it's, important to us. It sounds that's like very true, important. isn't it? And I'd like to think, John, that you and I have uh, blundered into each other here in this big, crazy world we live in, um, because this is the message that's missing in the headlines and in the rhetoric and in the divisiveness that we see all around us. There is more that unites us. Everybody has to say goodbye to a loved one. And everybody yeah. feels that. Right. And I stood on the floor of the hospital in Germany with Toby Keith as private first class Todd Balding was bleeding to death with an RPG center mass. He couldn't get it out. Right. I think I told you the story. Yeah. And you're right. When that spirit moves on, you can taste it in the air. You it's know just the atmosphere has changed. And your tears might come and they might not come, but your inner spirit mourns painfully. Yeah. In the, in the moment with a, a family member like your dad, it's like the great memories can cure that. And guess what? Yeah. That, that's, that's colorless. That's ethnicityless. That's religionless. That's originless. That's sexual der derivation. It, none of those things that supposedly divide us, they don't divide anybody in my life. We Isn't there, here's one thing that, that I find amazing, uh, you know, in my, you know, I, I, you know, obviously we've all gone through losing a loved one. And, you know, when my dad passed um, and when I was speaking at his funeral, in terms of, you know, the physics of spirituality with an attitude, what I felt with my dad passing is even to this day right now, memories are energy. And those, that energy got charged by the physical passing. The memories are, they're vivid, they're happier, they're better than ever. And it feels like while when one thing dies, another thing rises and that the memories of my father are better and crisper than ever. And I feel as though, you know, when we lay one chapter to rest in our life, we look, we're able to look back so much clearer and move on from that and to learn from that, that closing of that chapter. And we're on to the next one. And rather than, you know, feeling this great grief, I felt this joy. And I, and I, I said at his, uh, at his funeral that I see my father in the way that the leaves blow in the wind. I know that that spirit is there and I hear it in the birds chirping and I see it in the green grass. I see it in the, in the stoutness of a rock. I'm like, God, all those things to me represent life. 
John, do you think we can bring people into that campfire of more spiritual focus? I mean, I know for a fact the world needs it. Um, I see what I see on TV and I read the headlines and I witness the dishonesty and I witness the confusion and the misprioritizations. And every time I watch that, I go, these people, they need to return to a spirit because that spirit would unite us. If you, if you were aware of, delved into, better understood, and shared the spirit of the human experience. And I've been able to share campfires with, you know, the, yeah. Wattis, the Aborigines of Africa in the Sudan and Botswana and Zimbabwe and South Africa and and the Native Americans in every state of the country. And I'm telling you, everybody in the world, you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to go bow hunting. You don't have to wait right. for to do this. But I would like to see more and more people pursue both a, a figurative campfire of communication, and ultimately, I'd like to leave in our vapor trail on the physics of spirituality with an attitude, the spirit campfire, a communication literally around a fire. A campfire brings things out that you're not going to get at the coffee table. Am I right about that? You are, you are totally right about this. I, I completely right about this. And I do think that, you know, everyone needs to get in touch. And we look, we're using the word spirit. You can use the word God, universe, whatever. You know, it's like we all know what we're talking about, but getting a little God in your life and getting back in touch with your spirit, it's something that we do invite everyone to really reflect on. And I, I, when I say I pray morning, noon, and night, I ch look, I, I check myself all the time. Like, am I doing my best? Am I present? Am I trying to deliver positive energy that will perpetuate itself? Something that I try. And I think that we all, we all need to try better on that, but we have a very special guest on our very first episode and we're going to share a campfire with someone who was on Salute Across America, a true American hero. We have Omar Crispy Avila joining us right now. Crispy, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good, thank you. Uh, let me just start off with, I'm no hero, but I know a few. Oh, I mean, Crispy, I know that you're a very humble man. I, I honestly, I'm so honored just to even text you, just to talk to you, I feel incredibly honored. Um, you know, Ted, one thing about Crispy that, that, that really connected with you, uh, when he was on salute across America with us was his love for the outdoors and his love of hunting. That's something that, that really struck a chord with you. Well, you know, uh, Crispy, we could probably have John take a break for the next couple hours and just talk about, <laughs> talk about backtrack <laughs> and sunrises and opening days and the rut, but you're right, John. There's a connection, and it goes back to the aboriginal early man, that our life came from hunting. Our life came from understanding the animals. That's why those, those, that artwork on cave walls paid homage to the beasts that gave us great challenge and great sport in food, clothing, shelter, medicine, tools, fuel. Literally, we burnt the dung to keep warm. Um, so that is a connection I think Crispy and I have. But I'm fascinated. Originally, first of all, how old are you, Chris? I'm 34. And when did you start your world of hunting? Were you raised hunting, or is it something relatively new? No, so I grew up in, in South Texas in Brownsville, and um, hunting really wasn't big down there. It was more of a, you know, it wasn't a priority, and then we didn't have the means at the time. So I actually started hunting um, after I was injured and got invited to go hunt with a couple of friends, and then it just kind of... The passion grew. I fell in love with it. It was kind of the same thing you're saying. And I've noticed that when I've gone on, on, on hunts, whether it be in, in Alaska, in Canada, um, all over the country, I feel a connection with our ancestors. You feel that that, that love and, and you kind of, in a way, put yourself in their steps. Like, you know, you, you start thinking of, man, you know, our ancestors walked this land. They hunted this land. They chase the stem elk that I'm chasing with right now. I may have a modern bow or a modern gun, but everything is still there. And, and it's, it's just a connection that I, that made me feel like, it just made me feel like I was alive. It, it, it made me feel 
in tune with myself and, and most of all and, and made me close out everything else that was going on and I have to focus on the task similarly to being in the service again when you're you're given a task and you got, you got to make sure you know you give it your all to to complete that task it was a sense of purpose and it's kind of what helped me transition out of the service into the civilian world well you know if I may John um, this perspective uh, that he was raised hunting and, and basically a casual suit when it was convenient and like you said it wasn't that serious of an endeavor and i've been able to share campfires with the heroes of the military that went through life-threatening near-death experiences uh crispy i'd like you to elaborate because i know our listeners would be fascinated we call this the, this physics of spirituality and there's a lot of people that are disconnected from nature that just turn the faucet on and think that the water just got there by rote or that the beef in the grocery store counter didn't get killed or whatever. There really is a disconnect um, out there. But most people would say, spirituality, what the hell is spiritual about taking an animal's life? Crispy, tell them. You know, to me, um, it, it's a sense of the, the, the preparation to it and actually getting to the animal and actually putting your hands on it. And, and every time that I've that I've gone hunting, whether people will see me or don't see me do it, I always place my hand on the animal and I thank it for giving its life so it could feed my family, so it could feed me, so it could keep us going, especially in a time right now where, you know, there's still a lot of people that, that, that are going to the stores and can find meat, but all I got to do is open my freezer and it's full of meat from, from me going to, to uh, you know, Colorado, wherever, and I hunt it. And, putting my hands on that animal and thanking it and just connecting with it. I, that's the spiritual um, connection that I get to the outdoors and with the animal. It's not just I kill, 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 and, you know, I'm bloodthirsty because, you know, I was in the service and whatnot. It's a different connection, and it is very spiritually because when I come home and I defrost, you know, that, that elk steak and I cook it, it brings me back to that moment and it makes me appreciate that animal again and it makes me you know kind of give a little quick prayer just to say thank you for for the food that is still right. providing for me and my family it's That's exactly it, what i wanted the people to hear exactly <laughs> and, what, and what what's incredible crispy is the you know that connection with nature is one that i mean a lot of people honestly a lot of people who especially aren't hunters aren't gonna they they just don't get it they they can't understand that and one thing that I would submit is, look, if you're not a hunter, I mean, I'm, I definitely am not, I did not grow up hunting. I'm not a hunter. Like I don't have, you, you know, any kind of stories like, like uh, Ted and Crispy have, but I have always embraced, loved and respected the, the idea of we are hunter and gatherers. This is a, an expression. Um, this is something that it's not for everybody. But you have to at least, and if you're out there in the audience and for, for whatever reason, you're like, I don't like to hunt. That doesn't mean that hunting is bad. It's because you don't like to do it. It's something that we've done from the beginning of time. It's how we've survived as a species. And we've just evolved this notion of, you know, like I'm not a hunter. That's new. That's really new. So you can take those thoughts, put that aside and understand and certainly respect, you know, guys like Ted and Crispy. Um, for how much how much hunting does mean. And one thing, Crispy, I wanted to hit on with you was the healing power of nature that we talked about um, a couple weeks ago. You you really were zoned in on, you know, just the idea, you even mentioned about the sound of the wind and how you just feel so alive being away from everyone. Ta talk to our audience about how just nature, not even hunting, just nature makes you feel alive. Well, yeah, it's one of those things, you know, we, we live in a modern world where we have so much access to to social media, to everything that's going on in the world, and you tend to have a division, right? You know, you have either your left or your right, and one's right, one's wrong, and, and there's really no in-between. There, there's a constant fighting, there's a constant pointing fingers at each other and, and blaming one another, and, and for me, you know, like I said, having that access, you start reading all these articles, you start agreeing with some, you don't agree with others, and, and it just creates this, this stress in your life. You know, it, it's, it's first world problems. It creates this, 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 
you know, this chemical in your body that just drags you down. It, it, it wears you down. And for me, going into the outdoors and just stepping outside and actually just listening to the wind or the animals or, or making a plan of where are we going to start hiking? How are we going to chase these animals? Like, you know, grabbing your, your arrows and taking a quick uh, practice round before you, you even go hunting the next day. All those things recharge my batteries because th there's no longer the stress of the city. There's no longer yeah. the stress of social media or keeping up with people or are you wrong, yeah. are you involved, or you're not involved. Like you care or you don't care. All that is out the window and just being able to, one of the things that I do is I take my one shoe off where I've got one leg and I actually like touching the ground and I just feel like instantly in, in touch with where I'm at and everything else is gone. I think it's real it's, that's important. Amazing. That's so beautiful. And here's what I'd really like to convey, John. Talk about the healing powers of nature, probably more important today in 2020 than ever before. And all those that might be, well, I'm not a hunter. I couldn't kill anything. Crispy and I spend hundreds of hours hunting. The kill lasts four seconds. <laughs> You're out there all the time. So if you if you have yeah. any reservations at all about killing your own food, which is essential and is perfect, but yeah. in the modern world, I understand the disconnect. But here's your Uncle Ted tech tip on the Spirit Campfire opening night 2020. You don't need to hunt. You need to find some grass and some woods. You need to see where the pavement ends. And I kid you not, I've had thousands of experiences. You go to my Facebook and you read the unsolicited testimonials where people are running around in the city, got to rush hour, get to the gate, got to the office, got to go to the, and where's the word? You know that? Those that have heard Uncle Ted's recommendation, they just go find a farm. Maybe an uncle's got a farm. Maybe the neighbor's got a farm. You, you know somebody with a farm, I promise you. Or New York Central Park, you might be able to get away with it there. New Jersey, the Garden State. There are woods and fields and streams everywhere in this miraculous United States of America. I don't care how pissed off you might get these days, how kind of friction you experience. Crispy will tell you, and John, you yourself, as, as a non-hunter, you know this. The minute you leave the pavement, you will walk slower. You yep. will breathe easier you will think clear and when you're done you'll have better sex so i don't <laughs> have any recommendation i can give you but if that's not the physics of spirituality with attitude I, but I'm not I don't know what it is. those of you that don't hunt find a place it will cleanse your your soul yeah am i right I, so we have about we have about 15 more minutes for our first episode here i wanted to open up some questions um, if you guys go to Ted's Facebook um, and go to the comments, pose some questions. I'm going to be able to read it right here. Pose a question for myself, for Ted, for Crispy. Um, these guys who are incredible hunters. One thing that I have picked up late in life that I have found a tremendous amount of joy in is spear fishing. And I find so much joy in traveling around the world, going to exotic spots, figuring out what's the native species, hunting, like, like physically having to hold your breath, try going down. And most importantly, when you get that special fish, your job is to eat it and to provide for others. And you never kill something that you're not going to eat. And that idea, you know, the, a lot of people like to, you know, rod and reel fish and there's nothing wrong with that, but there's something about spear fishing of picking out one and putting forth a lot of effort and being with nature. Like you said, you guys have spent thousands of hours out in the, you know, out in the wilderness, not, you know, not, uh, it being involved directly with the hunt. The hunt lasts such a short amount of time. For me, spear fishing is that same thing where you're underwater for a long time and the actual kill is like this, but when it happens, you're like, this is taking me effort. I have intended to do this. I now have something that I can provide for my family. And it, there really is for me quite a rush to it. Spear fishing is underwater bow hunting. <laughs> Believe it me. Is. And, <laughs> it and, is. And John, you have to admit, all these places that offer fresh fish, nowhere close to the one you spear. I mean, that's what I eat. I've, I've been eating venison and ducks and geese and pheasant and quail and doves and rabbits and squirrels and woodcock and grouse 
and woodchucks and elk and antelope and bears and cougars all my life. It is, you know, everybody's talking about we need to get back to organic and closer to the ground. Hello, <laughs> all my life. That's what I've been doing. <laughs> and, you know, and I, I, until I had to have both of my knees replaced, I could outrun almost anybody because it's really the healthiest diet. But that's the physics. The spirituality is understanding your stewardship responsibilities to balancing the populations to make room for the next spring production and what's the spirituality of it. When I, I got to tell you, when I cut into a backstrap fresh off the mesquite coals, uh, it's not just the meat of the animal, it's the spirit of the animal. He's giving me life. That bluegill fillet, that, that trout fillet, that, that uh, walleye, it's, it's, a, it's a mystical connection with God's miraculous renewable creation that I suppose you can just ignore that, but after a while you won't ignore it because you're eating the flesh of a beast. We have a uh, question. I have a question, uh, Crispy. What is, here is a, a, a question here of what is your favorite animal to kill and eat and how do you prepare it? Oh, man. Um, wow, that's such a hard question. Um, I, I, if I would have to go back and say one, and, and I've been saving the last pound of meat that I have left from this, it's moose. Um, I was able to go to Alaska about two and a half years ago and hunted with my father and came back. And I mean, we, we've had it every single way you can think of. We've done meatballs. We've done, uh, you know, like the, we've done the quarter on, on the smoker, um, right. backstrap, everything. And, and for me, moose has been my favorite. But when I don't have any moose, elk, elk is my favorite meat. Um, it is just I cook it anyway. I mean, it's just there's no wrong way of cooking elk. You, you know, you can do whatever you like, and it's just gonna taste amazing. And then kind of touching with what Ted was saying, you know, you you can taste the different in the meat. You can buy the steak from the store, and then you can buy you you know you can eat your own steak that you harvested, and the the flavor it is 100 different. You you can definitely taste how organic yours is and you're not paying an extra amount of money to someone right. else because they're telling you that's organic. That, uh, Hey, Ted, we have a question uh, uh, from the audience about how do you feel about uh, killing an elephant that no one eats? First of all, there's no such thing. I've hunted elephants. They eat elephants. It's a big deer. There, that's really, that's the greatest question we will ever field on this show. That right. that ignorance and that propaganda exists that when we harvest the surplus elephants to save lives and to right. balance the herd, saving gazillions acres of habitat. When I killed my elephant that had killed villagers coming out of the Thule herd that was dangerously overpopulated because somebody who was that ignorant said, well, the elephant Ever hurt you? Why did you shoot them? I don't know. What did your tuna fish salad ever do to you? My point is, those natives came from miles around. Within two hours, John, there wasn't even any bloody sand in the Lompopo. Every right. scrap of meat, the fat behind the eyeballs, the ears, the snout, the ivory, the toes, the feet, the skin, the tail, it's revered. Elephants are big venison. Native. Here's the pomposity of an American. To think that they can dictate what Africans eat is one of the rudest things that mankind has ever perpetuated. The Africans eat giraffes and kudu and gemsbok and eland and wildebeest. They eat, they eat monkeys and they eat, they eat elephants. It's meat. And by the way, it's life and death protein for those native people. So what a great question. I don't mean to, you know, chastise the questioner, but that someone thinks that when we kill an elephant, you don't eat it, that that exists in the world today as a manifestation of a cultural deprivation that really offends me. And Cochise right. is trying 
that people have abandoned that responsibility to respect that giant animal that feeds thousands of people? Great question. That's uh, yeah, it's awesome. You know, one thing that's uh, overwhelming in terms of all of our comments uh, on we're we're streaming on YouTube, we're streaming on Facebook, um, we're streaming on Killcliff's site. Um, the overwhelming majority of people commenting are saying, I need this tonight. And uh, <laughs> crispy the where people are just saying, they're saying, I need this tonight. What is the, this? I don't, I mean, it could be a bunch of different things. I don't know. I mean, what is I need this? It's just, it's just a broad question. I mean, do you need a podcast or you're enjoying the conversations or do you need the meat? Or do you need to go out and hunt? You know, you still have time to put in for tags. I just got mine for Colorado, so mm, <laughs> more of. But um, I don't know. I think right now this is the perfect timing to be talking about something else other than than what else is going on in the world. I think there's so much distraction, so much negativity, and to actually have something like this right now where it's i'm not saying we need to walk away from it and not talk about it but to have a little break in between to actually yep. talk about something else i think it's a great thing that people were, were looking for and I, I think that's what they were saying when you know they stated i need this right now i think Absolutely. what this is Absolutely. john i'll tell you what this is this is truth logic common sense experiences from people who live these experiences and are sharing but mostly it's positive energy and it's people sharing that truth, logic, common sense, goodwill, decency, positive spirit yeah. that never judge anybody by anything except the content of their character. Crispy yeah, a hundred percent. Crispy and I, and I, I love share it, campfire everywhere in the world, and we're going to. Absolutely, we are going to share campfires with literally everybody. I mean, I think our job as a species is to share that campfire, like like Ted is talking about. You know, we sit around, we talk, we exchange ideas, positive energy begets positive an energy. Crispy, when I, I love the phrase and I live by the phrase, positive energy begets positive energy. There, there seems to be energy sucks in the, in, the, in the world, right? You meet somebody and you just feel dirtier. You're like, that person that just sucks the energy out of me. That yeah. topic of conversation, that place in the world. Talk to me in your experience. What's giving you positive energy these days? Well, the people that I surround myself with, right? It's just like yeah. you said, when, when you Amen. meet somebody and you don't feel you don't feel that connection, you don't feel that positivity from somebody, you tend to steer away from that, that, that type of person because, one, I've always told people, when you meet somebody, make sure that you make their life better than when it was when you first met them and vice versa. If you can bring a value to someone, and they bring a value to you, then you're doing an injustice to someone else. So that's kind of where, where, where I've been. You know, the people that I surround myself with are positive people, hardworking people. And, you know, there, there's no excuses. There's no, but it's just hard work. You keep pushing forward and you are who you are, you know? And then that's kind of what, what I've been able to do is keep myself surrounded with people that are positive and, and that have the head on straight and want, better for the tribe and the tribe would mean all of us what Chris um, said. yeah exactly <laughs> what that guy said yeah. uh, hey crispy so the uh yeah, the sponsor for tonight's show is killcliff and i know that you have a relationship with killcliff uh tonight if you go to killcliff.com and enter in the code campfire you get 10 percent off okay look at uh crispy cbd ted has not had the cbd drink cbd what t t tell everybody about the CBD drink for Killcliff? Because I, I mean, I all I can tell you is that it tastes amazing and is amazing. What, what's your experience? Oh man, so it, it's helped me with a bunch of different things. Um, anxiety has been a, a big component that I've had uh, after the injuries, and you know, you tend to deal with it, but there's times that it just gets a little bit too much. Um, I've been able to to drink one while I'm driving, or I'll have one at night before I go to bed, and it helps me just go to bed, it just calms everything down and it, it, it doesn't necessarily give, it doesn't give you a high uh, feeling. It just, for me, it slows everything down and lets me rest. And, and it's just, it's kind of a, everything's gonna be okay, relax, you got this. Hey, uh, Ted, I got a question for you. 
Um, do you think people are reconnecting with the outdoors because of COVID? Absolutely. In fact, there's been a big sweep across the country, especially when some corrupt politicians said you can't go outdoors and go fishing. What? <laughs> um, um, here's the best thing to make you feel healthy. You can't do that. Right. So, I, my favorite thing about my fellow Americans is their defiance. I love defiance. When they hear something, <laughs> please, let's defy that one. So again, on my Facebook, it's turned into a global campfire. And there's no question that the increased stress and the isolation, because we're not an isolated species, we're a gregarious species. We like to yeah. we like to reach out. We like to touch people, both physically and spiritually and intellectually. And we like to hear different ideas and different dreams. And it expands our idea spectrum and our dreams. So I have heard from thousands of people just on Facebook, not to mention my daughter and my grandkids and my son and all that. The, the whole Nugent family is slamming home the slabs, man. We got the bluegills coming in as fast as you can get out that knife and take that delicious slab off them. And I've heard from people who, most importantly, had never fished before. They heard that they weren't allowed to go fishing. And their first thing, right. I don't think I'm going to go fishing, you dirtbag. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they went out. And here's the beauty of it. The ex exaltation. They go, that was more... I don't remember having such a good time. It was yeah. so peaceful. And the fish, I didn't know really quite how to do it, but once I figured out, it was delicious. So what's better, escape? Peace. The dog, my dog's left. Peace, peaceful, escape, and delicious. Those are the battle cry for even yeah. good times, but especially during the isolation period. I'll tell you, during the isolation, I was in Virginia with my family and literally everybody is like, what are we going to do? And, you know, the list of things that you, it, it was like, you're not allowed to do anything except, except stay at home. So mm -hmm. as a family, we're like, we're going to go fishing. <laughs> so we were, we, we, we got our boat, went down to the lake and could barely get in the lake because the line was so long. <laughs> Oh wow! Everybody else Beautiful. had the same idea. It was like the dock, <laughs> they, like somehow it was closed, but everybody oh. was fishing. I'm like, it was so incredible. And where you're out there, and nobody cared if they caught anything. You're like, I'm just outside. I'm on a boat, and I'm fishing. I'm happy. <laughs> Speaking of happiness, as soon as as soon as Governor Whitmer declared that we couldn't plant a garden, paint, or go fishing, mm -hmm. planted a garden, painted, and went fishing. And finally, they authorize it. Like any humans got the right to <laughs> authorize those activities. So um, it's a beautiful moment where um, power abuse uh, met a dead end brick wall by people who are smarter than those who think they have the authority. But you're right. I use the term cleanse the soul. That was a term from the great Fred Bear and the great outdoors will indeed, no matter what is harming you, including the tragedy of an injury for a hero, or a terminally ill child. I've seen it all in the outdoors. You don't really have to catch a fish. You don't have to shoot a deer. You just go for a walk and it will, Crispy said, charge your batteries like nothing else. Nothing else. Hey, Crispy, what did you, during uh, during the isolation, you got, you're, you're living down in Texas. So you, you, you were let free. Uh, from the COVID uh, quarantine, like I am, I'm, I'm living down in Georgia now, and well, thank God. Every single day. <laughs> I didn't, yeah, exactly. None, none, of, that, none like, of those rules apply to me. Yeah. So did you did you uh, like did you stay quarantined? Or were you out in the woods like during the whole thing? I went turkey hunting. Turkey season was here, and uh, I, you know I had to get out and go do what I do. Put up my decoys when I had a good time. Um, you know, still kept the respect for others that that. You know, where we're quarantining and keeping away from others. And that's a great thing about yep. the outdoors. I mean, who's going to give it to me out there? There's no one around me. It's just me, my slate ball, my decoys, and my shotgun. And and that's it, you know. So, no, I still went out. I did stuff. Went hunting. I went fishing. I mean, we went down to the coast not long ago and, and chased uh, reds. And, you know, now we're, we're getting ready to go back and go chase snappers since the season opened. Um but, but to me, it's just, it just the way of life. I was not going to stop um, doing it. You know, I, you're gonna, I took precautions, but it wasn't something that was going to slow me down and prevent me from putting me 
in the freezer for my family. And, right. you know, coming back to the question that you asked, uh, Ted, I, I think there is going to be a big spike in the hunting industry this year because people are realizing that when there's a meat shortage, what do you do? What do you get yeah. it from? Where does it come from? And it's, yeah. I can't tell you the amount of friends that I have that are not hunters, that don't own guns, the amount of text messages that I was getting, and how do I set up? What rifle should I get? Where should I go hunting? Can you connect me with guides? And then, you know, what ranches are good in Texas? I want to put some meat in the freezer. Like, show me the ways. And, and that was just me. And that was about 15, 20 friends. I can't imagine every other hunter out there, how many text messages and phone calls they got from friends that aren't in the industry or were never even thought of harvesting their own meat and now going out and doing it. It's, it's, there's going to be a spike and, and people are just at the point where, you know, they're, they're going to grow their own vegetables. They're going to grow their own, they're going to go get their own meat and that's how they're going to yeah. provide for their families. And they're going to get that gratitude of what it feels like to put actual meat that you worked for on the table. Yeah. That's what, what's interesting is when uh, all the news was breaking about the supply chain breaking down <laughs> they're like, like we're not gonna have any meat <laughs> hey crispy and uh ted was your supply chain broken <laughs> my supply chain has never been broken in fact you know i hunt a lot I, I my soul needs lots of cleansing so i've always <laughs> hunted at least seven eight months a year the rest of the year i rock and roll my balls off but i hunt and fish and i run a trap line so i'm always connected i farm my ranch i plant food plots i cut trees i work on fences and fill feeders it's a real lifestyle it's a real down-to-earth grounded conservation lifestyle and the nugent family hunts such game rich property both in michigan and in texas that we kill so many deer and antelope every year that we donate tons of pure organic venison i think i told you this before it's worth repeating we donate tons ourselves to soup kitchens and homeless. Yeah. But every year, hunting families donate over 250 million every year hot meals of venison. 250 million hot meals of venison every year to soup kitchens and homeless shelters. It's almost yeah. like Mother Teresa with a bow and arrow, man. It's perfect. It is. <laughs> um, well, listen, this has been absolutely incredible. The response on all social media platforms, on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook, has just been overwhelming. This is a new program that we're gonna that Ted and I are doing, and we're going to have campfires from every walk of life all over the world. And this is what we need. What we need right now are honest conversations, real conversations, positive energy. If you're out there and you're looking for positive energy – Make sure you're following our feed. Make sure you're following Ted. Make sure you're following Kill Cliff. Make sure you follow Crispy. Crispy's going to be a regular guest because he's amazing. Crispy is, is, is such an unbelievable human being. And we're going to have people like Crispy on. And we're going to have honest, positive conversations. So this is the end of our first episode. But before we go, I wanted last thoughts. Crispy, what's, what, what's your last parting thought for us? Um... If you have questions you've never hunted, ask friends, stay in touch. And most of all, you know, stay healthy, listen to one another, pray, uh, reach out to your neighbors, be kind, love one another, and, and just just be a good human being. It's, it's, it's the, uh, the message at the end of the day that I want to say. Just be a good human being to others, and everything else is just going to be okay. Wow. Ted, what's your parting thought? You know... The exact same thing. That, <laughs> you know, bottom line is um, I surround myself with positive people, my family, my band, my crew, my friends, my management, my neighbors. We always get together and we have barbecues and we shoot our machine guns and we talk about wildlife habitat and we talk about environmental stewardship. And we talk about putting pressure on our elected employees to make sure that the people Crispy's talking about, the good, positive, hardworking people, that we make an impact on policymakers. So you can talk all the peace and love you want, but unless you actually participate in, as a positive force, a thoughtful, truth, logic, common sense, bring forth the evidence that supports your beliefs and express that to your elected employees now more than ever, because we see that people aren't, who aren't interested in truth, logic, or common sense or much honesty, they're raising a lot of hell so I think our founding fathers wanted all Americans to be just like Crispy. Wanted them to be I, 
touch and positive and have that physics of spirituality. So, Crispy, you and I will share a campfire and we will get some backstraps. Right? And we're going to bring John. We got to bring yes. backstrap campfire. I'm in. I'm in. I'm not, look, I'm not against hunting for the record for everybody. I just need someone to teach me. We got, I you. don't. <laughs> So we I got it. We're gonna whatever we're gonna do. I gotta go crispy. The three of us are gonna go hunting. You guys are gonna go. school me. We're gonna film it. We're gonna do a live stream on our yeah. first hunt. Absolutely. We'll do a campfire. We'll get the technology right out by my yep. shop here because I live on wildlife paradise. And we'll we'll talk about the experience because I think, John, when you get out there with the mindset that you're gonna harvest your sustenance, yep. I think it will change your perspective. It's much like you talk about spear fishing and bringing that sacred slavage to your family. It's, it's, totally. a, it's a more e e emphatic example of that. So I can't wait. Crispy, you and I will double team him. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. That's awesome. All right, guys. Well, listen, thank you so much for spreading some positive energy and for our audience out there. Thank you so much for the positive comments. Honestly, this has just been ridiculously positive in normal social media. Normally, social media is just full of a bunch of trolls just throwing out negative energy. I don't know where they are tonight because they're not here. And that is that is a blessing. Uh, listen, I cannot thank you enough, Crispy. Can't thank you enough, Ted. Can't thank you enough, G-Dub behind the scenes, Herbert behind the scenes. This is the Spirit Campfire. God bless you all. We will see you next time. Stay tuned because we'll be, we're creating a schedule for the next episode. God bless. Godspeed the positive spirit. Good job, guys.